Hi again, and welcome to the Physiology by Physio podcast. As usual, my name is Greg Rodden, and I'll be your host. So Physiology by Physio is one of the newest collaborations between Inside the Boards, Physio, and my own podcast, Med School Phys. We'll help you get a richer understanding of physiology and pathophysiology for your medical school classes and for your board exams. Uh, So one announcement before we jump into the content of this episode on pregnancy physiology. So in addition to intern life, I've been helping to write a book with two of my friends from Inside the Boards, Chase DeMarco from the Medical Nemesis podcast, as well as Ted O'Connell, writer of the wildly successful Step 2 Secrets book. And guess what? It is done now. So the book is basically like a study skills slash life skills book that will help you to dominate medical school. It's called Read This Before Medical School, How to Study Smarter and Live Better While Excelling in Class and on Your USMLE or Comlex Board Exams. I admit that the title is a total mouthful, but that's kind of what you got to do for SEO these days. And I should also note that even though we labeled it as Read This Before Medical School, It's really an amalgamation of pearls from the educational and psychology literature that will be helpful for anyone at any point in their journey. We also reference a ton of study strategies, productivity hacks, services, and products that we personally used. Also, something cool that we did, if you're on the fence about buying the book, you could also check out our Essentials PDF, which is kind of like a 15-page executive summary of the essential points of the book, which can be found on our book page at freemeded.org. You can find a link to this page in the show notes. We would really love your help with getting this project the kickstart that it needs in order to become more visible to a wider audience. If you're interested in more information about the book, if you have feedback for the show, or if you have any other questions, feel free to email me at greg at insidetheboards.com, all one word. And lastly, if you find our content to be valuable, take a second to rate, review, and subscribe and share Physiology by Physio with your friends. We love the idea of spreading organically, kind of by word of mouth, so if we're able to make that happen, that would be awesome. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's move on to today's podcast, which will focus on reproductive physiology of pregnancy, and all of this will be relevant to your USMLE, Comlex, and beyond. The opening section will focus on fertilization, then we'll dive into various physiologic changes of pregnancy, particularly those related to the cardiovascular system, as well as we'll cover what a molar pregnancy is, or a hydatidiform mole, and much more. All right, so you're ready to get started? Okay, so I'll have the guys from Physio start us off. So first, let's talk about fertilization, which happens on day one of ovulation, and then implantation onto the endometrial wall of the uterus happens six days later. And then for the first eight to 10 weeks, the syncytiotrophoblasts of the embryo will release human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. And what this does is acts on the corpus luteum, to make the corpus luteum to continue to release progesterone and estradiol. Then after eight to 10 weeks, the placenta will begin to release progesterone, estriol, which is even weaker than the estradiol coming from the ovaries, and it will also release human placental lactogen, or HPL. The placenta will also release relaxin and prostaglandins. And it's also important to know that during pregnancy, prolactin will be released from the anterior pituitary. So here's the uterus, the fallopian tube, and the ovary. So the ovary will release the secondary oocyte. It will then enter the fallopian tube where it gets fertilized. And as we mentioned on the previous slide, this likely occurs on day one following ovulation. Then the zygote implants on the endometrial wall of the uterus. And as mentioned in the previous slide, this occurs within six days of fertilization. Then, almost immediately, the zygote releases HCG. And this HCG will stimulate the corpus luteum within the ovary to persist, preventing it from degrading into the corpus albicans. Therefore, the corpus luteum can continue to release progesterone and estradiol, and these are necessary for maintaining the endometrium during pregnancy. After about eight to 10 weeks, the placenta is developed to the point where it can release its own hormones. So once the placenta is developed, HCG release will decline dramatically, and the corpus luteum will degrade into the corpus albicans. Then the placenta will release 
progesterone, and estriol. Now this is an important point. The ovary released estradiol, but the placenta released estriol. So some students remember that estradiol comes from the ovary before the corpus luteum dies off. So diol dies off. Once the corpus luteum degrades or dies off, the placenta will release estriol. Okay, now that was a great primer on fertilization and the production of hormones related to pregnancy. Now let's take a slightly different tack by thinking about a clinical scenario. So with all of these hormonal changes in pregnancy, the anterior pituitary increases in size by about 50%, mostly because of the stimulation of the lactotroph cells by estrogen. These lactotroph cells are pumping out prolactin, right? But how can these changes at the anterior pituitary come back to bite us? Well, let's say you have a G3P3 woman whose recent pregnancy went very well, but her delivery was complicated by rather heavier than expected bleeding. The bleeding was eventually resolved in the hospital, and she's discharged after three days. Mom then takes the child to the pediatrician a few days later, and she explains that she's really disappointed because her milk hasn't come in yet. She was hoping to breastfeed this child like she did with her other children. So what could be going on here? Well, this is a pretty classic story for a condition known as Sheehan syndrome, where during the pregnancy, the anterior pituitary grows in size and has additional perfusion requirements. But because of the heavy bleeding during delivery, all of a sudden the anterior pituitary becomes ischemic and infarction takes place. In her case, she noticed the symptoms because of a precipitous drop in prolactin production from the anterior pituitary. Hence, her milk supply hasn't come in by one week. But Sheehan syndrome isn't always this benign, right? Because the anterior pituitary controls other important hormonal axes like growth hormone, uh, thyroid hormone, the adrenal axis for cortisol, as well as FSH and LH production. So Sheehan syndrome can be a big deal depending on which hormonal axes are affected, right? For example, if the adrenal axis is affected, the patient could present in an acute adrenal crisis after birth, which could kill the patient. Diagnosing Sheehan syndrome is a classic step one boards question, so be able to recognize it. In this mother's case, it'll be important to get an MRI and then to identify whether she requires any hormonal replacement therapy. All right, so I hope that little clinical scenario of Sheehan syndrome was helpful. In this next section, we'll discuss more of the physiologic changes in pregnancy from a systems-based perspective. We'll start with the hematologic and cardiovascular systems. So first question, what do you expect to happen to blood volume in pregnancy? Well, blood volume increases by about one and a half plus liters, or around 30 to 50%, depending on the person. And one liter of it can be found in the placenta and uterus alone. So what's driving this change in blood volume? Well, think about its overall purpose. Number one, to support the increased metabolic demand of pregnancy, we need more O2 carrying capacity, which means more blood. And number two, during the birthing process, the mother can lose a lot of blood, right? So she's going to need some volume in reserve for the postpartum period. Okay, cool. So that gives us the overall purposes of extra blood. Now onto the mechanism, which isn't as concrete as I would like, but I'll give it a shot. So at the start of pregnancy, the placenta is rapidly growing, and to keep the blood flowing towards the placenta and the fetus, vascular resistance is kept low at the placenta. This change will decrease the overall systemic vascular resistance for mom, but so much of that blood flow is shunted towards the placenta that the vasculature in the kidneys experiences relative underfilling of the arteries. And in compensation, this underfilling of the renal arterioles will appropriately drive up the RAS axis. The net effect is that aldosterone will promote sodium and volume retention, thus driving up blood volume. For similar reasons, ADH levels rise in pregnancy as well, which promotes free water retention at the collecting duct. So both aldosterone and ADH are rapidly increasing the plasma volume. Meanwhile, relative hypoxia from the underfilling at the kidneys will drive up production of a certain hormone called erythropoietin, and EPO will stimulate the bone marrow to increase red blood cell production, which increases the red cell mass. But the red cell mass doesn't rise nearly as fast as the plasma volume, which will produce a classic dilutional anemia of pregnancy. As a side note, platelet count is also being diluted along with the red cells, so platelet counts can appear relatively low in pregnancy too. But the absolute red blood cell and platelet count are usually fine. 
Okay, so those are the mechanisms driving up the blood volume. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, it's so you don't freak out if you see a pregnant woman with a hemoglobin of 11 and platelets of 140. Keep the underlying physiology in mind to understand that those are not alarming numbers. All right, everybody, this is Greg from Inside the Boards, and I'd like to cut in here and give a quick shout out to our sponsor for this episode, which is Physio. If you haven't figured this part out yet, we at Inside the Boards really do love what the guys at Physio are doing for the scene of medical education. Uh, first off, they produce this fantastic library of easy to consume videos, which cover everything you need to know about physiology for your classes and for the boards. But then they didn't stop there. They went on to produce two more libraries of rock solid instruction for biochem and biostats, and their microbiology videos are currently in the works. So they're just super busy and they're getting it done. But in creating new content, they didn't just like stay in their comfort zone with the old 15 minute long whiteboard style video. No, 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 no. At Physio, they understand that while some topics are best learned by focusing on the underlying process, other topics will just require brute force memorization. So to meet the needs of their learners, the guys at Physio came up with a cool new hybridized learning style that includes both Pathoma style whiteboard videos integrated together with sketchy style picture mnemonics. And by seamlessly integrating these two tried and true teaching tools, Physio will help you to master med school. And now back to the show. Okay, cool. So now we know to expect a dilutional anemia in pregnancy, and this transitions nicely into a discussion of the cardiovascular system. So what are some changes you expect to see with the cardiovascular system in pregnancy? Well, we can break this up into changes that take place during the gestational period itself and those that take place during labor. So first, during the gestational period, what's the main cardiovascular change you think about? Well, it's increased cardiac output, right? So we have to ask ourselves, why does this happen? One way to think about it is simply that there's increased metabolic demand in pregnancy, so we need to increase cardiac output to meet that demand. But we can't stop there, right? Like we mentioned earlier in the episode, during gestation, the cardiovascular system takes on a significantly increased blood volume. And this increased volume will help to stretch the ventricles a little bit more, which will increase stroke volume and thereby increase cardiac output. But that's still not all of it. While we have increased blood volume, we also have this new player interacting with the maternal circulation, the placenta, which forms a new low resistance circuit connected to mom's circulation. To briefly describe what's going on here, with lower systemic vascular resistance, the heart has less resistance pushing against it, which will increase cardiac output. So why is the placenta low resistance? Well, the answer to this is twofold, for structural reasons and for humoral reasons. From the structural side, when the placenta forms, it's literally burrowing into maternal blood vessels, converting them from those endometrial spiral arterioles into uteroplacental arteries that lack muscular and elastic layers. And this creates conditions at the placenta where maternal blood basically spills into these cavities or lacunar networks, referred to as the intervillous space. And structurally, without the normal microvascular control mechanisms of a capillary, spilling of maternal blood into the intervillous space will plummet vascular resistance, similar to what you see when a patient has an arteriovenous malformation, or AVM. But unlike with a pathological AVM, in pregnancy, this change is a good thing because blood in the intervillous space can now directly interface with all of those little chorionic villi projecting into the intervillous space. The chorionic villi provide extra surface area for interfacing of mom's blood with fetal blood across the thin placental membranes. Okay, cool. So in addition to this AVM-like structural change at the placenta, there's also local humoral factors being released, like nitric oxide and prostaglandins, to keep the vessels at the placenta dilated, which again lowers systemic vascular resistance and keeps blood steadily flowing towards the placenta. Okay, so then how does this tie back into maternal cardiac output in pregnancy? Well, remember that cardiac output equals mean arterial pressure, or MAP, divided by systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. With lower SVR, the denominator in the equation, the cardiac output naturally rises, because the system is giving less pushback against the heart. 
Or you can think about it this way. With less systemic vascular resistance, the heart has to increase its cardiac output to keep mean arterial pressure, i.e. systemic perfusion pressure, relatively stable during pregnancy. Either way, cardiac output will rise naturally during pregnancy, up by 20% within the first eight weeks and up by 50% in the third trimester. And we've provided the reasons from several angles to explain this increased cardiac output of pregnancy. A couple more comments here. Because of increased cardiac output, the majority of pregnant women have an audible, non-pathologic flow murmur that you can hear on auscultation. Systolic flow murmurs are usually asymptomatic and nothing to worry about but sometimes pregnant women can get themselves into positions where they develop lightheadedness or even syncopies. So how's that? As the uterus grows, it can compress the inferior vena cava, or IVC, thus decreasing venous return to the heart and producing presyncope from a sudden drop in cardiac output. Because the inferior vena cava is on the right side, these symptoms can simply be resolved by adjusting and laying down in the left lateral decubitus position. Okay, very cool. So those were some of the cardiovascular changes experienced during the gestational period itself. Now, what about in the immediate postpartum period? What would you expect? Well, labor is a pretty stressful experience, right? So catecholamines are released, which will increase the heart rate and blood pressure of the mom. But another important aspect to know about is that very soon after delivery, mom's circulation will get an autotransfusion of about 300 to 500 mLs of blood back into her circulation. Remember that the uterus and the placenta have a large amount of blood in them at any given time. So as the uterus is contracting down to stop the bleeding after delivery of the fetus and placenta, it's squeezing blood back into mom's veins. Plus, the uterus is no longer compressing the IVC, which further increases venous return. This autotransfusion event is important, and if it doesn't happen, then profound anemia can take root, possibly requiring a transfusion depending on the amount of blood loss. Okay. And this is actually a good point to take a brief tangent on the topic of postpartum hemorrhage, or PPH for short. Do you happen to recall the definition of postpartum hemorrhage? Well, it's greater than 500 mLs of blood loss from a vaginal delivery, or greater than 1,000 mLs of blood loss from a C-section. Earlier, we mentioned that estrogen increases procoagulant factors and decreases anticoagulant factors from the liver during pregnancy in an attempt to limit blood loss but sometimes that's just not enough to prevent heavy bleeding during L&D. And when the blood loss is greater than 500 mLs from a vaginal delivery, or greater than 1,000 from a C-section, then we call this postpartum hemorrhage. Do you happen to recall the most common causes of postpartum hemorrhage? Well, if you don't, I've got a great mnemonic to share with you. It's called the four T's of postpartum hemorrhage. Tone, tissue, trauma, and thrombin. Like we said before, normally the uterus should be able to clamp down to limit blood loss after delivery of the fetus and placenta. But what's the number one cause of postpartum hemorrhage? Well, it's actually uterine atony. Hence, tone is the first T in our mnemonic. The next one was tissue. So what is that referring to? Tissue refers to retained placental tissue. Retained placental tissue has torn up vasculature in it that will keep bleeding after the delivery, thus contributing to hemorrhage. And the retained tissue limits the ability of the uterus to clamp down, which only worsens the blood loss. Okay, so that's tone and tissue. Next up is trauma. Obviously, the birthing process can be traumatic with ripping of the perineum, etc., and those traumatic sites can contribute to postpartum hemorrhage. And our last T in the mnemonic was thrombin, which refers to coagulopathies that contribute to postpartum hemorrhage, like von Willebrand's disease or thrombin deficiency, etc. Okay, so to recap, our mnemonic to remember the causes of postpartum hemorrhage was the four T's. Tone for uterine atony, tissue for retained placental tissue, trauma for trauma, and thrombin for coagulopathies. All right, very good. So I hope that description of the hematologic and cardiovascular changes of pregnancy was helpful. Now I'm going to let my friends from Physio take it away with some of their great practice questions. So now let's do a question. Let's say a pregnant woman develops a deep vein thrombosis, or a DVT. Why was she more likely to develop a blood clot than a non-pregnant individual? Is her blood more viscous? And recall that pregnancy will increase the release of clotting factors. 
Now this increase in clotting factors is beneficial since it decreases the likelihood of postpartum hemorrhage. One negative consequence of increased clotting factors is the increased chance of developing thrombosis and clots, such as with this patient with a DVT. The second part of the question asks if her blood is more viscous. The answer is no, it is not. As you recall from the last slide, aldosterone will increase the plasma level of the blood relative to the increase in RBCs. Therefore, her blood, although more likely to clot, will actually be less viscous. Now let's do one more question. Let's say a pregnant patient at 21 weeks gestation has sufficient levels of progesterone. How will this affect her heart? Now as you recall, progesterone is heavily involved in pregnancy and it helps maintain the endometrium. However, progesterone also acts on the cardiovascular system causing vasodilation. This vasodilation will decrease the pressure on the aortic and carotid sinuses, thereby decreasing the parasympathetic output to the heart, or vagal tone. The heart will thus have an overall sympathetic stimulus, which will increase the heart rate. All right, let's finish strong with a practice question. Ready? A 39-year-old G1PZR woman is sent to the emergency department by her primary care physician for fluid resuscitation in the setting of hyperemesis gravidarum. She's only 10 weeks into this pregnancy, but she's been challenged with significant nausea and vomiting for the last two weeks. Her past medical history is unremarkable. She denies any use of alcohol or illegal drugs. In the emergency department, labs are drawn, including serum beta-HCG, which is significantly higher than expected based on dates. Vital signs are heart rate of 120, blood pressure of 90 over 68, and temperature of 37 degrees C. Transvaginal ultrasound reveals a honeycomb-appearing uterine lining and no identifiable fetal tissue. Which of the following is most consistent with this presentation? Is it A, 46XX karyotype, B, 69XXX karyotype, C, trisomy 21, or D, trisomy 18? And the correct answer is A, 46XX karyotype. This scenario describes a woman with hyperemesis gravidarum secondary to a complete molar pregnancy, evidenced by the very elevated HCG levels contributing to the hyperemesis, as well as the characteristic ultrasound findings, which showed no fetal parts, and I use the buzzword honeycomb uterus, or you'll sometimes see it described as a snowstorm appearance for a complete mole because of the abnormally dilated chorionic villi that form the placenta. So what is a molar pregnancy? Molar pregnancy is a condition where those trophoblastic cells, the syncytiotrophoblasts and cytotrophoblasts that are supposed to be establishing the placenta, start proliferating out of control. And they do this in the setting of an abnormal fertilization process. With a complete mole, an empty egg is ovulated and is then fertilized by a single sperm. The haploid material from the sperm then duplicates itself, producing a 46XX karyotype or sometimes a 92XXXX karyotype. But even though its karyotype is 46XX, which sounds normal, mom's egg didn't contribute any genetic material, so this is definitely abnormal fertilization. In contrast to a complete mole, a partial molar pregnancy is a scenario where two separate sperm manage to fertilize a single egg, producing a 69XXX or XXY or XYY karyotype. Again, this isn't a normal fertilization, and for some reason, the consequence of this abnormal fertilization process is dysregulated proliferation of those trophoblastic cells. Beyond knowing about karyotypes, there are a few more key differences between complete and partial moles that you need to know for the boards. First, which one has a risk of malignancy, specifically for choriocarcinoma? It's the complete mole, which has about a 2% chance of malignant conversion to choriocarcinoma. Complete molar pregnancies increase the risk not only of choriocarcinoma, but also of preeclampsia, so complete moles are completely worse than partial moles. Next, which one will have fetal parts? The incomplete mole will start to form an incomplete fetus before miscarriage occurs, so partial moles leave fetal parts behind. So the next point, which one will have very, very elevated HCG levels? Complete molar pregnancy will have very high HCG levels based on dates, which is what we saw in the vignette, and these very high HCG levels can cause hyperemesis gravidarum, 
whereas incomplete moles have milder elevations of HCG and do not cause hyperemesis gravidarum. All right, so those are some of the key differences between complete and incomplete molar pregnancy. Now, how do we manage these moles of pregnancy? Well, for both complete and incomplete moles, the safest thing to do is usually to terminate the pregnancy with DNC plus methotrexate. Keep in mind that this isn't really a future human. It's a dysregulated mass of trophoblastic cells that could become extremely deleterious to your patient's health. And one last point about moles here. After termination, you're going to want to have a pathologist take a look at the molar tissue, and you'll want to follow beta HCG levels until they reach zero to ensure that there isn't any residual trophoblastic tissue left behind. Okay, guys, and guess what? That is the end of the episode, so I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you guys next time. 